live streaming to people that can't come for COVID and other reasons and we'll record the presentation and obviously try and work it out with you guys here as well. So today we're talking about early intervention for work-related hip pain. So myself, Tim Mitchell from Pain Options and Dr. Lockie Milne, orthopaedic surgeon from Specialist Orthopaedics. So this is part of a project we've been combining with a few of the orthopaedic surgeons in Perth around getting hopefully some more optimal early intervention for people with hip pain. So I'm going to talk a little bit to give you a front end at the start in terms of some different bits of information, but then we're going to bring Lockie in and get his input on a few different cases and it's an opportunity to ask him some questions as well and we'll see if we can deal with live stream questions also or not. So just as a very quick overview in terms of managing both non-arthritic, it's broken down into an arthritic hip pain. So there are a range of, of clinical guidelines out there. Um, and this guideline is talking about non-arthritic hip pain. And there's a number of things in there. That these are just the broad headings, if you like, of things that we should be considering when someone comes in with non-arthritic hip pain. So thorough assessment focusing on function should be a really important part of that. Then imaging may be relevant based on that initial assessment, but certainly with non-joint related pain in the absence of trauma, for example, or significant overuse, there's less need for that imaging to occur early on. Steve's got his volume test going. Um, education for the person around, A, what's wrong and the different components of care that are appropriate for that. And often reassurance is a really important part there. Active management is pretty much something that should happen from the very start. There may be a very short period of rest required if there's a, a period of trauma or a really high level of pain, but it's more about activity modification than rest as such. Um, passive treatments, there is, they are in the guidelines, but they're certainly not recommended to be used as a standalone, so they should, should be used in conjunction with active management using patient reported outcome measures to track outcomes, so obviously are they improving or not in the expected time frames. Medication where appropriate and at times injections such as a, a bursal injection for lateral hip pain may be appropriate. We'll ask Lockie a bit more shortly about intra-articular injections as well. Um, and surgical review for non-arthritic hip pain, particularly if it's intra-articular, there's more relevance, but at times there is for lateral hip pain, but generally it's that trying the appropriate, appropriate first line conservative management first, which usually involves a good dose of appropriate graded active rehabilitation. So the next guidelines are around um, hip and knee OA symptoms. You go again. Yeah. Um, so the basic components of the guidelines are pretty similar. You can flip through these pretty quickly. Um, a key thing is around person-centred care, because we know with osteoarthritis, it's a lot, a lot more than just the arthritic joint, so being the whole person factors around that. And the imaging doesn't give us the whole story around arthritis. The correlation between the imaging findings and the level of pain and disability isn't necessarily that strong, so there's another Sorry, a number of other whole person factors that need to be considered, so that's where the education comes in with that. Um, and obviously active management and exercise, because um, beyond going to surgery, it's exercise and weight loss, the two key components along with your simple analgesics early on. Um, so again, medication and injections certainly have their role. Um, all pain factors, and we'll talk about this with a couple of cases, that becomes really important. And then the surgical option, again, for people that either, I mean, obviously, if they're major trauma or something like that, the story is different. But if it's a, a gradual onset, then they need to um, put, uh, sorry, try the other appropriate components first. So this is just some data that we did with a, a study looking at hip pain in the workers' compensation system. And what we found was that in the system, there's a lack of adherence to guideline-based care. And around that, the key things we were looking around is those simple things that can be done around early active rehab, pain education and reassurance, along with simple analgesics and activity modification. So this was quite interesting, because the most common diagnosis that we saw in these patients with work-related hip pain was hip joint pain. 
And if the GP gave them a diagnosis of hip joint pain, that tended to send them down a very different path of management as opposed to non-specific hip pain or lateral hip pain, for example. So, if we go to the next slide. Um, Non-guideline-based care is a component of that. The other components that we're looking at is fragmented care as barriers to good outcomes. From there, considering these other factors, and we'll talk about this again in terms of risk factors for poor outcome. So mood, obesity, smoking, central pain or, or increased pain sensitisation, those factors are relevant, um, both for work-related pain and then also for surgical considerations, which Lockie can talk to also. Other reasons, the guidelines of who should be managed surgically or not, and then the decisions or delays in the workers' comp system around approvals, which I know we'll talk about in a couple of the cases also. All right, so going back to the, the graph I showed you about what people get with a diagnosis, and so you can go forwards, <laughs> but think about that graph. Sorry, Tim. Down on five. I'm getting there. So if people got a hip joint diagnosis in the workers' comp system, they often went to early referral for orthopaedic review and investigations and injections and surgery were happening earlier in their management. Versus if people had a hip pain diagnosis that wasn't joint, a proportion of them got guideline-based care, but a proportion didn't. So a lot of these recovered just based on diagnosis from which was on the first medical certificate, which could have been GP or could have been someone else if they were FIFO, it could have been a medic on site, for example. So just the pathology concept of it's a hip joint problem often dictates care. And the big thing around the hip joint diagnosis was just with having that diagnosis, there was a big delay into active management. So on average 50 days before they started any active management at all compared to a, a non-joint pain diagnosis. So that might be good or it might not be good depending on you know, the factors involved for each person there. Then if they had this joint diagnosis, often from an insurer's perspective, they'd be going, hang on, this is really early, should they be having these other procedures done? So that can create delays in the system. So we were seeing a lot of these as specialist physio reviews where there was either a lack of guideline-based care or conflicting opinions on appropriate management. And I'm sure you guys have all come across that and that has its own set of difficulties involved in it. So what we did is looked at developing this collaborative hip care program. So trying to improve outcomes for workers and using a team of people, so rather than just relying on a single opinion or not. So it was between pain options, Lockie Milne and two other orthopaedic hip surgeons in Perth, Peter Del Sandro and Tao Lin. Um, and interestingly around the process of that, um, which I'll come to in a minute, it was pretty easy, because we had this initial thought of, oh, how will this go if we speak to the surgeons and how do they want to manage these patients versus what we think we should be doing? And there was basically no disagreement. It was just working out exactly how we could structure that. So that was really good from a physio perspective and I think from a, a surgeon perspective as well of, of having that um, consistent approach to it. So why do we go about this kind of program and, and has it been done well before? Um, our recovery options review service, um, we've put over 500 workers through that now, which is workers coming through early, so ideally two to six, sometimes 12 or a bit longer weeks after their injury. And just getting the right information, checking they're getting guideline-based care, and across a couple of insurers there's pretty good numbers around cost savings of the claim, and also the workers are happy with this, so that's how we first started. And then there's other research, this is in Tasmania, where strong agreement between advanced scope physios and orthopaedic surgeons around um, orthopaedic diagnosis and management. So there's, there's some good evidence already that this can work. So this HIP collaborative care program initially involves a screening with one of our musculoskeletal physios. And from that process, some decisions are made are uh, it basically is this person getting guideline-based care, but it's also a quick check to go, do they actually need early orthopaedic opinion? So that could be in the form of a desktop review, 
um, which can happen really early on, or it can be in the form of a, a consult with one of the orthopaedic surgeons, either very early or at different time points in that process. So what the review involves is getting the story, and obviously if someone had a traumatic injury, then the need for imaging and perhaps orthopaedic opinion if there's hip joint signs becomes much more important compared to someone who's had gradual onset of symptoms or some fairly straightforward overuse type symptoms. Um, understanding the pattern of that in terms of does it fit with mechanical hip pain or is there broader widespread pain symptoms going on that suggest it's not just a local hip problem for example. Just giving the worker a chance to give us their understanding of what they think is wrong and what they need because often that's the, the biggest box to tick. Um, are they getting guideline based care? And then considering screening for other risk factors, so that's around their beliefs, so what they think is wrong, the guideline based, or not getting guideline based care rather. Um, if they've got increased pain sensitisation, workplace factors, workers' compensation, the actual claim related factors, mood, obesity, smoking. So we worked out with the surgeons the things that they wanted to know if they were seeing these guys as well, so they're not having to repeat all the same information necessarily, but picking up those higher risk for poor outcome, but also potentially surgical risk as well. Um, so the examination has a physical exam to it, so orthopaedic tests and do they correlate with radiology if that's been done or not, function and capacity, and then screening for other source of symptoms, so is this actually a back issue or is there something going on in the knee or is there a nerve related problem like radiculopathy for example, and is there increased pain sensitisation present. So then communicating that plan in a really brief report that everyone gets and is on the same page around guideline based care and then involving other health professionals as needed. So setting time frames from that, sticking to it and then just reviewing the, the progress with that. Okay, so that's roughly what the process involves. Any quick questions at the moment around any of that? All happy there? So this is hopefully the interesting bit where I'll, I'll bring Lockie in. So this is, I've called this old school process. If you want to just click down a couple of these, Darren. This is a gent that was a 43-year-old truck driver. In August 2019, he injured his left hip and his right ankle. ankle. I think he was jumping off the back of the tray of a truck. So had a, a combination of injuries there. When he presented, there were a range of other risk factors with this guy, including mental health factors. He'd initially seen an orthopaedic surgeon who suggested he needed early hip surgery, but then that surgeon changed their mind. And then they ended up being seeing Lockie, and then Lockie referred this guy to us, because we saw him at four months, and he was on crutches at that point, non-weight bearing, and doing nothing, and he couldn't really tolerate much weight on his other ankle, because he'd had an injury on his opposite ankle. <laughs> so he was in a bit of trouble there. So on assessment, there was clear hip joint issues, and from my assessment of that early on, it looked like, you know, and it correlated with his radiology, and it looked like he would ultimately need surgery. But there was a range of other risk factors going on. So there was around mental health stuff, there was workplace things going on, there was insurer things going on. This guy had no funding for anything. We ended up getting this guy going to hydrotherapy, but we funded his Uber to get there. So there was a real block from the insurer end as well, just to try and get this guy starting active care at four months into his injury. I think that was partly due to the message from the original surgeon. Yeah, the yeah. original surgeon said, you need physio, you know, go and do some hydrotherapy. And, and that was it. You know, there was no discussion with the physio, there was no direct referral, there was no checking to make sure that he'd made it there. Yeah. Um, and, and I think when someone presents at four months, not weight bearing, I think it's a, real, a really big danger. It's a really bad prognostic factor. Um, and so getting, getting someone like Tim, pain options guys involved, for me was absolutely essential before we considered surgery because you know, going into surgery, that level of deconditioning would be a disaster, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and straight away, I thought this guy needed surgery, but he, we needed to get it to the insurer in a way that they said, okay, yeah, fine, that's, that's a good idea too. Jump up here, that's all right. We'll make it easier to hear. So if you go to the next slide, thanks, Darren. So 
you, you can talk through this. In I think you ended up trying a, a cortisone injection because he was really stuck yeah. with his symptoms and not progressing, and that was the thing that helped him the most. And this is one of my questions also around if you inject the hip joint, then that changes your time frames around surgical consideration. Can you talk to that? Yep, so I mean, for, for hip replacement, for example, we wouldn't consider surgery within three months um, due to the increased risk of infection from the immunosuppression component of the injection. I think there's less evidence for, for cortisone now, perhaps um, better, more recent studies come out and show that it has really a positive long-term effect. But for me, the injection buys you a little bit of time, might give you a transient relief of symptoms, give you some confidence that there is a solution. And, and so an injection, whether it's just local anaesthetic or local anaesthetic and steroid, I think can have a positive effect on, on the patient's outlook. You know, okay, there is hope. I've had people walk in after an injection and say, this is my hip hasn't felt this good in five years um, because they've got the local anaesthetic in there. And that gives them confidence that they're taking them the right steps or making the right decisions in, in going down the surgical path. And for, for me as a surgeon, if I had a patient who came in and they had an, a local anaesthetic in their hip and I examine their hip and there's no difference at all, then I'm running in the opposite direction as fast as I can from surgery because the, the prognosis for, for surgery of surgery for a hip that doesn't respond to injection is going to be poor or not as good. It's, that's including if there's, would you do more than one? Uh, injection attempt? Look, it depends on who's done the injection. I don't, so Pete, Dale, Sandra and Tao both um, inject their own hips. I don't. My life is far too full already to do that. But I have very good radiologists close to my rooms and I, I organise those radiologists to be in clinic on the day when I'm there. So I know the radiologist has a CT scan of the needle in the joint and contrast in. And so we know it's in the joint. If that local anaesthetic has no effect, it's, it's not, not good. So you want some sort of effect from that. And so Pete and Tao won't operate without that injection. I will in some circumstances, particularly needle phobic patients. You know, I'm not going to sedate someone to do an injection. And some people won't do that. So um, I think the injection in this situation was to, to buy us some time because I knew that with the care you had up to date, so there was no way we were going to be doing a hip replacement within a, a short space of time anyway, which was the surgery you needed. It's still a bit of a trend, I see, where it just, just, this doesn't work, let's try the next thing, this doesn't work, let's try it. And that still happens where it's on the injection, it doesn't work, surgery seems to be the next answer, unfortunately. Do you see that changing in the orthopedic field? I think, you know, so from when I started my training to now, the understanding of your problems in young people, or and joint preserving problems, if you like, has enormous change in obviously, and it's and it's been better understood. It's you know the trainees coming through with the guys who are back now from fellowship are, are being trained better than the guys who are ten years out when I started my training. So I think yes, it will change, um, but I think the vast majority of established surgeons are still using exactly what you said. You know, um, you know in our discussion with. Tim and Darren and Steve and the guys initially when we met was we don't even want to see the patient for the first three months until you guys are fed up. You know, because the first thing we're gonna do when we see a patient with hip pain is refer them to physio. Uh, and and unless the patient has had physio, appropriate physio. And you can't have sham physio. So if someone comes to me and they said I've done physio for six months, you've actually got to find out that they haven't been parked in the corner of the tens machine on, they haven't had something else which is not effective. So they have to have exercise based, guideline based care. Um, otherwise, you know, that physio has been a waste of time. So, yes, I think you're fighting a battle with some people, but I think the next generation coming through will be better trained. And that's, as I said, it was refreshing when we had these conversations of how do we put this together, that <coughs> there was no debate, I think, about anything at all. It was just agreeing with how we could structure it and how it would be most helpful. So, I think, as a, from a physio clinician perspective, that's what's been also very helpful around this, you know, clear communication from both directions and are we make decisions based on good information. We can say, look, this person's tried appropriate care, they're not progressing, it's no good wasting more time, as opposed to, no, they haven't had the right care and they could go find 
without surgery. The, the, our problem, I have to say, is that we get referred to the patient first a lot of the time. And, and I find that intensely frustrating because the, physio, the GP should refer to the physio and have that, that care before they see us because it's the logical first thing to do with something non-invasive, something safe. And unless they're not tolerating any exercise and then, you know, the possibility of injection, you know, that would be the, the best way that we, we do, I just automatically divert, and this has happened, you know, at times, we divert the patient's referral to the physio who's experienced in managing this problem, and they take those first steps. Um, I think a lot of, you know, Tim touched on it a minute earlier, was about, you know, on that slide about the early management, and a lot of it is patient understanding of what the problem is, and the fact that most people don't need surgery is a big part of that patient education in that early phase so that they know that yes it is possible to get back to work with this problem I don't necessarily need to have surgery but surgery is an option if I don't get better. And that there's lots of research around there of the information there's a classic one around shoulders the information that the patient gets dictates how well they go, go with the management if they get told by a specialist uh, your shoulder stuffed you're going to need surgery you could try these exercises but I don't think they'll help as opposed to Look, I don't think you need surgery. There's a very good chance you'll go well with this exercise program. The outcomes are better. So if you've got everyone giving a similar message, it's pretty powerful, I think. Now, just back to Peter. There are other claims issues. He had a other IME input, this patient. And then he ended up proceeding to surgery with Lockie at eight months. But that's eight months of being on crutches, this guy. On a big dose of opiates as well. He was on a lot of opiates, so it was bad. Yeah, you can go down through those. Um, there was clear progress with his hip pain. I saw him a couple of months when he came in for a check-in and he was like, this is the best it's been in a very long time. So there was clearly a, a hip joint problem and he progressed quite well in function, but then there were different barriers and, and different other factors that fluctuated. He got to a point where he had some work capacity, but again, it's those other early risk factors that come to play when something gets delayed this long that often you know, continue to bear fruit later on in the claim, which makes them quite difficult to manage. And um, Lockie rang me a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about doing this, and he basically said to me, Tim, I don't know if I really want to keep seeing workers' compensation patients. <laughs> um, which I was going, and he described the reasons why. We've talked about a couple of them so far, but yeah. this is kind of a case that brings yeah. up some of those issues. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think the system system leads to poor outcomes in many ways. It drives the patient to have surgery at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. Um, and, and, and or they don't get appropriate care at the right time because the decisions are delayed um, or they're, they're not referred in an appropriate time frame. So for me, I find, it, I find these patients the hardest out of all my patients to deal with by far because um, the decision-making process is out of our hands. As a patient, I can't have a discussion with the patient and say this is what we should do because ultimately it's not their decision. And sometimes we've worked around that by, you know, the insurers actually paid wages and they've done the, the surgery on their private health insurance. Um, and we've had some really great outcomes from that because otherwise the, the patient wouldn't have had surgery. You know, through the work system, it was completely blocked. So um, I think taking away the autonomy of the patient to make decisions is part of what leads to a poor outcome and, and trying to get that that kind of decision making process back on the patient's um, basis a little bit would be helpful but uh, doing that in a timely manner so it doesn't happen at eight months when when the central nervous system has clearly been sensitised because it's pain sensitisation and long term opiate use it, yeah it, it doesn't the outcomes of surgery are definitely compromised you know, and that's that's my biggest frustration is that I could have Peter turn up in my rooms two weeks after his after his injury, and we could do the basics of central physio. But if we're not making progress, then we can do the surgery in an appropriate time frame. I think he would have been back at work six months earlier or more, and um, and would have been happier with the result of the long term outcome. All right, this other case was one that came through and, and didn't need orthopedic review. So, 68 year old worker with lateral hip pain came through the review at 10 weeks post-injury, had been recommended to have an, a lateral hip injection, but the worker didn't want an injection, doesn't like injections. 
So he'd been reviewed by one of our um, musculoskeletal physios. The symptoms were consistent with lateral hip pain. There was clear strength and functional deficits that looked like they were contributing to that. And based on the decision making, an injection wasn't as essential on their function and, and what their level of pain was at the time, and active rehab was recommended. And in this instance, that was an exercise program with an exercise physiologist, with just with some specific recommendations around the exercise. After two weeks of that, this guy reported minimal symptoms in his hip, didn't need the injection, and he ended up progressing really, really well and got good functional recovery quickly and back to pre injury duties. So that's an example of one that could have gone down the injection line that didn't want it or could have got some mixed information, but that one could be diverted quite quickly. This third case is an example where we use the desktop review. So a teacher with low back and hip pain, five weeks post injury, came through the service, unfit for work still at that point. Then from there, the GP had diagnosed L4-5 disc bulge and thought the leg-related symptoms were potentially nerve pain. And then there was an MRI that showed this femoral neck lesion as well to resolve uncertain relevance. So in this one, the symptoms were consistent on assessment with lateral hip pain. There were some queries around the diagnosis, but then there were also other risk factors with this worker as well. So there's workplace issues and, and mood issues as well. But in this case, a desktop review was recommended. And then from that, really, Lockie was used here just to review the MRI and confirm what's on the MRI is not a concern and not relevant to this um, patient's presentation. Agreed with the diagnosis based on the information from the, the physical exam that had been done by the physio and recommended rehab and could proceed with a lateral hip injection. Um, and that was communicated with the GP, so we've had orthopaedic opinion on this case, so communicating that to the GP, okay great, here's a plan of action, happy to support that. And then in terms of that, there was other communications around this, clearly workplace concerns for example with this worker. And then from there a structured exercise program with their local physio was put in place. Um, from that component of it, the return to work process started, but again, that was a, a difficult claim for other risk factors, but the, the diagnosis and pathology side of that was dealt with quite quickly. Any questions or comments on that so far? I think from my point of view on that, like talking about the, the review that we did or the discussion I had, I think it was with you, that one also Darren, yeah. The, as a surgeon dealing with young people with hip pain, or work-related hip pain. The, the most important thing that I'm considering is when they come in at the start, they say, well, how's the injury occurred? Is it a trauma? Is it, a, is it an insidious onset thing? Or is it no use? And Tim really talked about that differentiation. And how does their job predispose them to re-injury in the future? Now, if I see someone who's been doing a job for a long time, their hip has failed over the course of two years um, because they're a concrete finisher and they spend their whole time with their hip in 120 degrees of flexion for 10 or so hours a day and their range of motion is not compatible with that. And I'm thinking straight away, this is someone who's probably going to re-injure themselves if they do get back to work or might not like get back to work. And it may be worth thinking about either early surgery or do they need early retraining? You know, are we thinking that this person is someone who's just not suitable for that job anymore or never really was and has managed to put up with that for a long time. And I think that's where, as a, a surgeon, you know, what I want is a single operation that lasts the rest of their life. You know, if, if I'm involved, I want them to get better and I want them to stay better and not re-injure themselves because I see that as a failure of the surgery or as a failure of my perioperative counselling, if you like, as to how they avoid that re-injury. And I think, contrary to the way it, the, the system is set up for workers' compensation. Most of the time, hip injuries are not injuries. They're long-term, in, you know, kind of, they're, they're a reflection of, uh, well, they're not an acute trauma, I should say. They are an injury, they're not an acute trauma. So it's a repetitive movement and deflection in a prolonged fashion or too far beyond the range of motion um, that leads to the long, the, this, this, this long-term outcome. Okay? And, and so allowing people to go back to doing that, I think, is a failure if I think that they're going to re-engine themselves. Does that make sense?
does. Yeah. So, and then there's that issue of an ag aggravation of a pre-existing or underlying condition. That's a, a common term that pops up. But maybe from some of the insurers in the room, how does that fit? Because Lockie's talking, he'll see people early and he'll, on experience and their presentation, be going, they're not suited for that job. But that shift of change of goals from return to pre-injury duties to retraining, how difficult or easy is that early on in the claim? We if that's know early on. Yeah, and I we think that's really good. We need to know early on that there's, sorry to be disparaging to surgeons, but they say, oh, well, you can get back to doing that. And it's like, we need them to, so that the worker is still going down that route. Might be everyone else is saying, it doesn't look likely from our experience with dealing with these types of injuries yep. in this setting. We know what it's probably going to turn out like. So we then we exhaust some funds, pursuing the same employer goal, and then they're left with very little to actually go down the new employer route. Yeah, and so I think I reckon that is the biggest factor in long-term outcome is a change in behaviour after they get back to work or change into a different role. And you know, I've got two concreters that come to mind. One I treated two and a half years ago. He went back to work, worked for eighteen months, re-injured. Another guy who straight away I said your hip is never going to be compatible with doing this. And he used the time while he was getting over his injury to retrain. He's now an OHS guy at the same firm. So it's like that has been a huge win for him because he's, he's entered now a field where you know, he can work for much longer. He's not going to end up with long term hip arthritis. And he's used the time with, while he has been paid to retrain. But there's, as much as I say that, then we've also got our own thing. Well on this, but we've got employers or workers that they want to go down certain routes. So we've got, you know, while we, it would make sense to actually go and look no early and retrain if we need to. Yeah. But then we, we've got there's so many different stakeholders involved, and that is also a big thing that makes workers' compensation so great. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the same. If I have the same conversation with football. Football yeah. comes into me. You know, two years of hip pain, long-term injury, I say your, your hip's not compatible with footy. Okay, that's one of the first conversations we have. And you might get back, but I'm not doing surgery to get you back to footy. You know, and it's the it's the same kind of demands of a lot of people's jobs. You know, whether they're up on the line in a big truck or they're you know finishing concrete, it doesn't really matter if their job is not compatible with their hip range of motion. You know, it's it's going to re-injure itself, and, and so you know that's. For me, in my, my experience over the time I've been in practice, that's been my biggest improvement, I think, has been helping people make that decision early. But as, as you've mentioned, the challenges within the system is there's multiple stakeholders that have some input on the management. Yeah. And that's where it can be challenging. Is there another comment? How do you find the workers respond to um, the suggestion that the, the job's not suitable for them? Um, very well, yeah, generally, because they tend to know and all you need to do is sh show them the movement that they have restriction in, show them what their movement is that they do at work all the time, and, and explain the concept of the injury being a problem of the range of motion not being compatible with that, the demands of their job. And, and they get it very quickly. I mean, People will understand if you show them where the pain is when you flex the hip up and their job requires flexion. Um, and most people, I first say, the first thing I ask them is, did you injure your hip? And they're like, no, no, no it just started hurting one day. You know, and it wasn't like they, you know, Peter was a bit different. He jumped about like, two metres off the back of a truck. That's an injury. You know, but, but most of the people who I see with workplace injuries, I think that, the, that it's occurred as, an, as a repetitive trauma. I think the difference there, which we see all the time clinically as well, is when you listen to the story and you make sense of it and you physically examine someone and show them where the issue is, then you sit down and say, look, based on what you've done there, they're the same things you're doing at work, your body's not tolerating that. That's where I think you're effective at getting them to buy that, which is different from someone who might do a very quick consult with someone look at a scan and say, oh, you can't do this or that ever again. Do you know what I mean? It has to match yeah. with their story. I have a model of a hip, a pelvis on my desk, and showing them how the hip moves and, and showing them where the conflict in the bone, the bone in the joint occurs and showing them how the damage happens, 
is, is powerful in them understanding that people can visualize something uh, much better if they can see it in front of their in front of their eyes you know and and once they understand that the you know and I, I use very simple analogies I say that the reason that you've failed is because it's like it's like you've got a car and one of your tires is wearing out after 20,000 k's it's because the wheel is out of alignment it's not because you know you've you've been you know, driving erratically or the tires are bad it's because you've bumped into the curb and not down it's the, the alignment is bad and therefore you know, it, it will keep wearing unless you, you correct it or you change the way you're using it. And, and they tend to understand much better if you can show them the, the way it's, the, the damage is occurring and they, they, that correlates with their experience of how it's happened. But the other thing to that is, and we mentioned it earlier, you have people with radiological hip changes that still maintain very good function. We had another shared patient of a guy that fell off his bike, he was a, a footballer and then was told, I think it was 98, that he should stop doing running because his hip was wearing out and he ended up getting on and doing a number of long course triathlons over a number of years and then was very much into cycling and only ended up having hip surgery because he fell off at 50 k's an hour and fractured his femoral neck, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it depends what you're doing, it's not everyone that needs that, but when you match it with their limitations and that's their repetitions from day to day, I think those ones are quite obvious. Uh, I mean, I couldn't agree more with your statement that the radiologi radiological findings don't match symptoms most of the time. Now, all the time I see people with you know, what are considered burnt out arthritis, where they've had arthritis for 10 or 15 years, it doesn't hurt that much, their range of motion is still good. Um, and operating on that would be operating on an x-ray because they don't have pain. But then you see someone else who has far less in the way of changes and they're dramatically more symptomatic. So, yeah. And at this next case, 63-year-old um, worker with an acute hip injury, investigations confirmed local hip pathology, had an orthopaedic review and hip replacement was recommended early on. But then insurer referred to the program to review that because it was a very early recommendation for um, hip replacement. So at eight weeks, the assessment showed it was a hip joint issue and it was really a local hip joint problem. Muscle function, everything else was pretty fine. There was no other major risk factors. So what we'd seen had seemed sensible. So that was referred for a clinical review with Lockie, which was done and I think you saw the same thing and agreed that a, a hip replacement was required and then that worker underwent that hip replacement and did better than expected in the time frames that you might expect. Um, and this was an interesting one with the insurer because they came in under budget for projected costs of having a hip replacement and time off work and so on. So I think then that employer decided all their um, workers with hip pain should have hip replacements to, to get them through the system a bit quicker and have a better outcome. But that's a good example of where there's pathology and it's clear and it fits and early surgery can lead to very good outcomes. So that's the opposite of the Peter story. Yeah, and I think that's a, if you don't establish the long-term pain behaviours, it's, the recovery is much better. Yeah, that's how a system would happen if someone had pain in the private health insurance um, covered patient, they would get sorted out and then recover fast instead of being having it dragged out and you know, been on the long time pain kills for a long time. Any other questions or thoughts on that? Just around in general with the hip replacements, there's obviously different approaches and techniques with the hip replacements. And also, in terms of your preferences around that, does that differ much on what the, the worker's role is? And then does the different approaches impact on their recovery timeframes? Oh, look, I think it, you know, the early recovery is generally better with the anterior approach, but the long-term recovery is not dissimilar. Okay? Yeah. I think that, that my focus when I'm doing a hip replacement for a patient is not their result of six weeks or three months, it's their result of 20 years, 30 years. So that has to be our priority when we're thinking of doing such major surgery. And so I, I tend to go as slowly as my patients will let me go with their recovery. People are trying to go harder, trying to go faster, they want to recover quicker. 
and I'm holding them back because I want to make sure that the prosthesis integrates properly. And that's that's the big risk I think with driving people to recover quickly from a hip replacement is that the components have to obtain ingrowth of the, the bone and if you fail to do that then it can lead to long term problems. So uh, I think you know there's so many factors in hip replacement that in, that affect outcome and in reality most of them work really well and our registry demonstrates that our natural replacement registry. So if you've got someone and they're recommending a hip replacement, you know, there's not many jobs you can't do after a hip replacement, assuming that the pain is gone and the, you know, the, the patient's recovered as you'd expect. Um, I certainly wouldn't stop my patients doing much other than you know, kind of really heavy work, you know, manual labouring people will do, uh, patients who run and people, patients who kite surf and do downhill mountain biking and run 800 metres in competitions and things. So, the, the hip replacement will tolerate those loads if the muscles around the hip recover well. So how long is that integration time? Early integration. I, I, what I explain to patients is six weeks there's like a bond that's formed but it's immature and that, 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 that bond probably isn't really hard until about six months. But it's, it's enough to push, you know, I say no long walks until beyond six weeks. You know, nothing, nothing really out of the pool. Um, and then between six weeks and 12 weeks, they'll, they'll increase the load on the bike and in the water and, um, and walking. And then they wouldn't start playing kind of golf, tennis, um, that kind of activity between three and a half and four and a half months. But most people, they want to get back to, I've got a guy who was back surfing in six weeks and, and um, people will do it. It's, it's just really about how it feels. And, and it's the young men who tend to be the, least reliable and the hardest ones to deal with. You know, it's the, the ones who feel invincible and they, their pain is gone and so they feel that it's, it's time to get moving, but they don't realise, unless you're extremely explicit, that you, you know, they don't realise that you've got to give it a chance to, to, to grow, to like to, to bond. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of two periods of recovery. One is the recovery from the surgery, you know, when there's a really three, the two week kind of surgical recovery, and then it's a six week, you know, gain range of movement and, and maintain that range of movement and from six weeks on is when I think the recovery of muscle strength really occurs. And people who push it too early, I think that they they end up fighting the post-operative pain a little bit and then that's counterproductive. Is there, and this comes up from the patient perspective, obviously they want to get a degree of movement going fairly early, but if something's really stiff and painful, yep. What's the balance there between saying let's let this calm down a little bit versus you've really got to get this moving? Yeah, so I'd say range of motion with with early after hip replacement range of motion I have no limitation. You know, um, they can go as much flexion or extension as they want as as or as comfortable. Um, but they've got to listen to their body. So work within a comfortable range of movement. Um, I don't tend to see people with hip replacements end up with you know stiffness in a non-functional way the way knee replacements do. I think knee replacements. If you don't push through, you get sore, but that's a little bit different because knee replacements tend to be cemented in all the time, and so you can just push them as hard as you want and you won't get any adverse outcome. Um, yeah, hips, people tend to end up with a range of motion that is functional for them based on their activities, and most people, that's a really good flexion extension range, and unless you get them doing rotation early, which a lot of people hesitate on because of the risk of dislocation, um, and so they end up with quite poor rotation unless you've done good work. But I think in, a, in the same way that knee replacement range of motion often reflects what they had preoperatively, I think it's a bit the same. You know, I did some hips yesterday, and some people you cut through the capsule, it's an inch thick yeah. of capsule, which is scar joint capsule. You know that person's going to end up stiff, even if you do a perfect hip replacement, because they're, they're a scar, they're someone who produces scar tissue. And perhaps working a bit harder earlier will be good, but perhaps their scar tissue will just get angry and get more sore. So I think you've got to be really careful about creating pain in someone who's kind of laid down scar tissue around the joint because it can be inflamed by being stretched and pulled and pushed down. Would you communicate that to the patient? Like, do I? Seeing them most often, yeah, I always do. Yeah, I tell them that. And I, I think that. that <coughs> I think the most common reason that I would have someone with pain post-operatively is because they're doing too much exercise, <laughs> not, not rather than the wrong exercise, you know, and they've been told by the physio that they need to do three sets of these 20 exercises 
each day. And then they're sore, and I, I say, well, you just better do it too much, just like that. get in the water, do half as much as you're doing. Are you doing many resurfacings? No. I do some, only under really, um, you Can know. Can you explain? Why? Yeah. Uh, well, metal on metal is, in my opinion, not that safe. Okay, we know that a good resurfacing is great. I don't, I wouldn't have a resurfacing myself because of the biological effects of metal debris. And if you see a metal on metal gone bad, then you'd stop doing them. You know, I've, I've opened a hip before and black oil has come out. You know, and if you get an adverse reaction to the metal debris, then all the glutes just dissolve and you end up with a big cavity. And there's billions of dollars of lawsuits of metal and metal not bad. You know, they ASR. The reason people do it is for the large head. And I can do a large head that's running on ceramic. So it's a hip replacement rather than a resurfacing. But in my opinion, an anterior approach, short stem, big head ceramic on ceramic is just like resurfacing. And the data would show that the functional range of movement and the prongs data would show that they're basically the same. But I take a nanometer sized particle debris with an inert, in, you know, inert response to the immune system, and I'll take that over a heavily biologically active ionic metal debris which can destroy tissue. Um, What's my name <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just it's just a, a, a you know there are guys in Perth who do a lot of resurfacings, yeah. and the bulk of them will do really well. And I do them, but only when the patient really begs me because I try and talk them into a replacement because I think Is it's there safer. Any benefit to it? No, no. And if you look at the again coming down to a blunt instrument, but a, an unbiased one, our registry. If you look at under fifty five year old men, hip resurfacing. There's two, there's two prostheses that have left in there because the other 10 that we used to do, have been, the data's been taken out. They still do worse than all the under 55 year old men who have hip replacements. In terms of failure rate, by a couple of percent of 15 years. And if you just took the best two hip replacements, I can tell you that the failure rate would be half that of the hip resurfacings. So, so they're, they're, they're basically selecting the best resurfacings and, and then, you know, in, so for hip resurfacing you can't do them in small people, so you have to at least have a 50 head, 50 millimetre head, and that I'd be too small for that. Um, and so you're looking at big heavy men with big, big sockets. And it's, it's a very trendy thing, but they think they're having a, a bone preserving surgery, but you actually have to remove much more bone on the socket side, and that's where it's much more likely to fail long term, and that's where you end up with a much bigger problem in 20 years if it fails, because if you've got no acetabular bone left, you've got nothing to fix it to. We end up with a, a bigger problem. So I'm thinking, because I do a lot of joint placements in young people, like 12 year old on next week, um, you're, I'm always thinking about the next operation. How do I remove as little bone as possible and preserve as much bone for when the failure happens? Because if you do enough, that'll happen. You know? But the data supports us doing this. You know, you, you know, your risk of failure in someone young even in people under 30, is about less than 1% per year. So if that person can't walk, can't function, then the data supports doing it, but you've got to try and do it in the safest possible way. So, yeah, resurfacing, the ceramic on ceramic, you know, there is out, but I wouldn't have one myself because it's still experimental. My friend in Melbourne's done about 80 of them, two of them are fractured. So it's, um, it's not a magic solution. If they, if they come out and they look good, then women will be able to start having them again. And I think that's possibly a good thing, but I, I don't think your replacement's gonna disappear anytime soon. It's still a, a really good option for young people. How long would um, generally the, like, you know, talking about the value rate for hip replacements and the prosthesis, how long is a prosthesis kind of lasting now still? Like 50 years. 50 years. Yeah, so so we had, well, I saw a lady the other day, had one for 48 years, and that one was done 48 years ago. So based on our data, the rate of failure is linear after about the first three months. So you have an early failure rate from fracture, infection, dislocation, and people doing a bad job, or patients being stupid, um, or just being unhealthy smokers, diabetics, you know, uh, drug users, alcoholics, people who do dumb stuff um, and, and ruin the operation. Then you've got a basically a linear failure rate from then until 19 years, which is when we've got our registry data, and that registry has got about 400,000 hips in it, and you can see that they've failed about 
in women under 55 is the highest risk group and they're about 0.7% per year. In women over 75, about 2.2% per year. So if you're under 55, the data that I say them is that your risk of failure probably diminishes over time rather than increases. So if you're 75 and you were 55, you're probably going to, your risk of failure is actually dropping rather than increasing because we're not seeing wear. So they used to fail because of the wear producing debris, debris producing an immune reaction which dissolved the bone and then the prosthesis came loose. And that's basically been eliminated with the new prosthesis. So we'll still see fractures, we'll still see infections, we'll still see old ladies fall over and break the hip and they'll break their prosthesis or around the prosthesis instead of the, the hip itself. But people think hips are wear out, they don't wear out anymore. You know, we don't see really wear except for the ones that were put in before the new prosthesis came in. So that, that happened about 15 years ago. So all this, this idea that hip replacement lasts 10 years is just completely wrong. You know, if, I, if I pull out my data and I look at men or women you know, at 10 years, about 6% have been revised. Yeah, so that's a 94% chance of still having it. And in reality, the, the vast majority of people who have hip replacements will have a hip replacement, they'll disappear into the community and they'll never be seen again. And they'll function really well. So it's, it's a reliable operation. I guess what's happened is people are pushing limits on doing them earlier for a less, less wear. And that's where you get this mid-range group of people who, you know, Peter's an example where they had terrible pain and were non-functional, but the arthritis wasn't bad, okay? And in that situation, I think your result isn't going to be as good as someone who's had 20 years of pain that they've put up with and then suddenly become unmanageable. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very good, reliable operation now. It's good to select the right people, though. That's it, yeah, pick people who've got hip pain rather than back pain. Yeah, <laughs> that helps. <laughs> <laughs> this fifth case, this is a younger worker, it's a 31 year old, back hip pain, groin pain, doing a physical role, had only been able to get back to very light duties. They previously had some lumbar surgery, um, and they were reviewed at five weeks, and it looked like a hip joint issue, and recommended orthopaedic review, um, but also to be commenced, commencing active rehab, because five weeks in, and hadn't been doing anything. Um, but again, there was high work physical demands, which needed to be aware of, and there were some workplace issues. So this one was referred for an orthopaedic review. Uh, Taylor Lim saw this one, Lockie didn't see this one, but just Lockie's input on this type of concept where um, they were tried with a hip joint injection and had one day of good relief from that. So how would you or Teo respond to? That's, I think, a, it's, it's a bad thing that it hasn't taken away their pain. So I think that the cortisone injection in this situation is, is good if it can buy the patient some time to get stronger. You know, I see the, the, the key, the key um, input that in terms of long-term outcome that will, will make a difference is, is exercise. Exercise can't happen if the patient's sore. If you can get six weeks of good pain relief and the patient can get stronger, then you've got a good chance of that pain not coming back. So one day of good relief tells me they've got a good response in the local anesthetic, but the steroid's done nothing. So it means they're likely to get a good response to surgery if the surgery is required, but you haven't really helped with them being able to tolerate the exercise. So, I'd so say it's diagnostically helpful. Diagnostically the, very helpful. The therapeutic the not. Yeah. 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 And unless, unless you can augment it with some anti-inflammatories or something else, which is just going to buy them some relief of that pain, because I see a big barrier to achieving a good outcome with physio pain, and, and you get pain and inhibition of the muscles. People can't get stronger if they're really if their joints are really irritated. So the therapeutic benefit of the injection is really just providing a holiday from pain to get a bit stronger, and, and hopefully that when the pain comes back, the, the, the strength is what helps prevent it being a problem. And that's where, in this one, Teo did that, but recommended active rehab first. And that's where the patient goes through that, building up on the active rehab. And then after four weeks, yeah, there's progress, there's some degree of improvement, but then it basically, by eight weeks, using the outcome measures and reassessing the person, they plateau. So I probably would have pushed on at that point. Yeah. I would have said, just, just be patient. I think yeah. when I see these patients and they've got label tear or they've got impingement and pain, I tell them it's going to be probably 12 months until they don't think about their hip on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And, and I don't think it's realistic. Like a lot of the, the guideline-based care stuff is based on an outcome of three months. And I still see 
that at three months you're not going to be back to where you were before this happened. You know, anyone who's had hip pain would know that the hip pain, if it goes away, takes months and months longer to go away. And so for me, I just would have said keep going. You know, and, and I don't think operating is a bad idea, yeah. but, but I think that we'd probably avoid some operations if we were patient. So this worker went, underwent surgery and had a good response to that. And from the ones that we see with this, if they've gone well for four weeks and then suddenly they're not, then there's those questions come up. Have they increased work duties? Have they pushed too hard with what they're doing in terms of exercise-wise? Or are there any of those other factors that have wound this person up again? And if they're clear, that's when that argument, I think, is really strong to say, look, that's where you've just tipped yourself back a bit. Yeah. Let's keep working with the rehab. I, I talk a lot about load management in yeah. this situation. I think that they've got to understand that in, in recovering from hip pain with non-surgical means, I think you've got to be careful about a, going back to the things you were doing too soon, provoking, you know, stoking the fire. Uh, you know, you want the fire to slowly, you know, go out over time. And, and them understanding that it's not going to just kind of go out straight away, that they need to let the, the they're going to manage that load to stop it re, you know, reigniting in that months and months afterwards. Yeah, and then that's the insurance or the workers' compensation situation where this time frames and decisions being made yeah. and those Alternative different duties. stakeholders yep. okay. coming into it as well. So that adds yeah. to the challenge. Yeah, so I think, and in that situation, I think the workers' company is probably driving you towards an operation because yeah. we want an outcome. Yeah. Um, whereas in private practice, I would definitely be saying, look, just let's wait, just be patient. You've got them better. You know, you're functioning, day to day you're functioning. You know, so long as they were able to do something, you know, if they weren't able to go to work at all, and I think there's a lot of fear in people going back to work with these injuries, sort of re-injuring or ending up worse. And, and if this happened in a non-work environment, I think patients would probably get out of work at this point. You know? And if they're functioning and, and going reasonably well, then I'd push on. But if they weren't able to walk, work or function, then I'd be agree. Go ahead. Good. Any inquiries on that? I suppose that will say do you like doing them and what is the best time frames to do the like, lateral release? Do I like doing well. them? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Out of my surgeries that I do, yeah. it's my least favourite surgery. Yeah. And that's not because it's the hardest, it is one of the hardest, but it's probably because the outcomes are the worst. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the reason why I was... Yeah, and, yeah. and you've got to be realistic. So for me, label surgery is um, a really poor way of describing the surgery you do, and that's not your fault for using that term because it's what the, the general understanding is. So if I'm looking at a patient and they've got a label tear, my job is to understand why the label tear has happened because a label, label shouldn't be symptomatic if it's torn, it shouldn't be, and a label shouldn't tear in a in normal hip. So if, if a patient has got a label tear, I need to understand the mechanism by which it's occurred and, and treat that as part of the repair. So unless I can manage the impingement which has which has caused it, or the dysplasia which has caused it, I wouldn't go in and repair it. So I, I almost never, I can't say never, because I'd be lying, you know, it's it's almost never that I'd do a hip arthroscopy and do an isolated lateral repair because it just you know, unless you've got a hypermobile female playing football, you know, that's someone who could impinge or you know, like someone who does, you know, ballet dancing, you know, you might have extremes of range of movement. But you have to treat that abnormality in the alignment of the hip at the same time as you treat, otherwise it's just destined to recur. Now, unless they dramatically change the demands of their job, work, life, sport, whatever it is. And do you have like a, like, you know, an age group that it would be better for yep. versus, you know, yep. other ones? Because, like, definitely. You know, we've seen, you know, when they've had lateral repairs or, you know, those kind of procedures, and then, you know, that a year is, down the track, it's they end to a yeah, so that's very, very clear. And the anchor group in North America is about 25 surgeons who've published the results of their open and arthroscopic surgery, show that the results are fantastic in under 30s. They're good between 30 and 40, and over 40, they're really quite poor. So I wouldn't have a hip scope myself. Yeah. So, and, and I tell that to my patients. If someone comes in with a label tear and they're 45, their hip would have to be radiologically absolutely perfect before I consider doing it because you know that there's collateral like you know, I say to them, you know, your skin doesn't look like it did when you were twenty, the inside of your hip doesn't either. It's not it's not it's a normal aging process of damage within your hip. 
and it's not an injury which you can repair and things will live happily ever after. It's it's a slow traumatic event and expecting it to return to normal is not realistic. And, and patients, I think, are empowered but very disappointed. You know? they're, you know, they're like, what do you mean you can't fix it? Well, I can send you to someone who will have a try, but I, you'll probably have a hip replacement sooner if you try. And the data supports that. And the result of the hip replacement will be worse for having tried. Which we've seen. Yeah, no, it's, there's, the results are clear. Fail, failed previous surgery is a marker for adverse outcome. And, and you know, in this town, there's a small group of people who I think understand the hip and treat it really well. And there's a bunch of people who go in, in there having done a weekend course in North America or somewhere and do surgery, which they, like, hip arthroscopy out of all the surgeries I do is the, the most challenging by far. And to do it without doing a, an extensive period of training. And you know how many I saw my training here? One in five years. Um, so it's not something which is done from the public system. So if someone wants to do it as a surgeon once they're qualified, they really have to do further training. And the group that finished years before me, they didn't really do that. So the, the skills they have, they've learned from getting better, but some people will just try. And, and that's not good for patients. All right, in the interest of time, we might stop it there unless you've got any other last burning comments of... No, I think, I mean, I, I couldn't support this more in terms of, you know, like I said to Tim when we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, this is a very difficult group of patients to deal with. We're all doing our best to provide them care and if we can do something collectively to improve their outcomes, I think it's in everyone's best interest. So, yeah, streamlining care to for these patients so they get access to the right people at the right time, I think it's good. Very good, thanks guys, thanks for coming. Um, there's a little bit to eat and drink if you want to hang around for a bit more of a chat. Otherwise, thanks very much, cheers. Thank you.